All right. So I have a few minutes here before my next call. So I wanted to go and answer a quick question on Quora through uh, Anchor as well as the screen share here. So we have some good content. I did answer it last night at about 2 a.m. Um, so I actually have to go back and make sure it's, uh, it's, it reads well. It was a little late. But the question is, cold emails are not working for my B2B SaaS startup. What am I doing wrong? Now there's 59 answers, so it's a popular question. It is a loaded question. You can go any direction with this. There are hundreds of reasons why a cold email may not be working. And working is obviously um, you know, subjective. So let's start with um, one thing that could be not working is getting opens but not replies. First step is to get a reply. Next step is to get, obviously, a positive reply. Um, so I like to look at opens and non-replies in a few different ways. Uh, the first way is the subject line not matching the email itself. So if the subject line overpromises and the email copy underdelivers, you'll get high open rates and low reply rates. Um, you know, when you don't want to create a clickbaity subject line, you want to be very straightforward. I like to be a little subdued. Um, company name plus subject, um, or sorry, uh, receiver of the email's name. Um, that's a good way to go. Um, now, uh, if there are issues with the body copy itself, obviously you'll get open rates. They'll skim through it real quick and decide that they do not want to reply. Issues being spelling, grammar, uh, the email copy is too long. So right off the bat, if they open it on mobile and it's too long, they'll just opt to not read it. Um, if it's poorly written, so if they get through a sentence or two and they just don't find it uh, easy to read, they will not read the rest. Uh, if it's sent from the wrong person inside the company and wrong person, obviously I'll, I'll elaborate on that. So um, you'll get higher open rates if you do send from the founder, co-founder, someone higher up in the company. Um, people like to talk to someone in charge, um, someone higher up. The higher up, the better. The CEO, co-founder is the best in my experience. Um, and uh, your CEO, co-founder won't obviously let you just send cold emails from their standard email box. Um, so or email account. So what you're going to want to do is just create a new email that is their same name, um, just different format, and have someone that they trust um, manage the replies. So if they need to get looped in um, to a reply, great. Uh, but most of the replies you should be able to handle, and uh, that CEO should trust you to handle them on their behalf. Um, now, uh, if it's the first email you have sent them and they're purely curious, uh, you'll get opens, but um, low replies, obviously. That's that's pretty standard. So open rates for cold emails, in my experience, typically 40 to 60%, um, somewhere in there. So if you're getting really high open rates and no replies, you know, it's, it's a new audience. They are curious to know who you are, so they'll open it. Uh, but, uh, you know, reply rates focus, I, I'd say a good average for reply rates is around 4%. And we'll talk about positive reply rates. Now, positive reply rates, what are those? If you don't know, obviously, um, they are replies that indicate some next step in the communication. So, yeah, let's schedule a meeting. Demo request sounds good. Let me know uh, if you have any more information. Those are all positive replies. Um, emails that, uh, sorry, email platforms that are built for cold emailing will have um, reply detection obviously. So they will automatically tell you if the email reply is positive or negative. And you can actually look at stats and look at campaigns based on how many positive replies that you get. Um, that's a good first KPI to know that your email campaign is working. Now, if you're getting uh, positive replies or if you're not getting, sorry, positive replies, your email campaign's not working um, for this reason. Um, uh, I, I suggest looking at the call to action in your email. Um, do not try to force a sale. Do not try to force a demo request. Sorry, a demo schedule um, in your first email. And we're talking about SaaS companies again. Um, try to open the conversation. You know, do you do this in your business? Do you use Excel for managing spreadsheets when your SaaS business is a business that uh, replaces Excel for that specific reason? Uh, do you struggle with this? Yada, yada, yada. Um, now, another reason you may not be getting positive replies is your email is focused on you, um, your company, what you're doing. 
you're not focusing on the prospect itself. Uh, you need to be very specific. You need to let them know that, um, you know, you've done your research, you know who they are and they are fit for your business. And you do that by focusing the email on them and not your company. Um, and always, always, always run a nurturing sequence. So if you're not getting positive replies, um, you know, a, a number of reasons that could be happening, but if you're not running a nurturing sequence before the cold email is sent, uh, your reply rates, your positive reply rates, the success of your campaign is going to be lower. Um, so this is a big one. And a nurturing sequence is basically hitting them with a couple touch points before the cold email comes across. Touch points could be um, an ad. So retarget them, upload your email list to your uh, LinkedIn uh, ads. Um, I'm sorry, your ads dashboard, you can do CRM retargeting. You can connect your Marketo, Alok, um, you know, you can use Zapier to connect your CRM uh, to your LinkedIn ads account and just hit them with um, some sort of a thought leadership ad, something like, you know, here's us with this company and how we increase their yada, yada, yada by X percent. Read the case study, right? Um, hit them with that ad. Uh, then another phase in the nurturing sequence could be sending them a connection request from the person that's going to be sending the email. I really like doing this. Um, it doesn't always have to be a connection request. You could follow them. Uh, you could retweet something of theirs. Um, hit them with some sort of a push notification that shows the person's name and their face, so a social account from that person that's going to be sending the email. And then um, another step could be sending them the message um, through LinkedIn or other platform, um, letting them know, hey, you know, here I am. Uh, you accepted my connection request. Let's talk. Uh, and then finally, and that if they have not replied to any of those with a, uh, a cold email sequence. So nurturing the prospects is a good reason, or sorry, a good way to uh, make sure that your cold emails inevitably work. Um, the next thing I'd like to stress is getting into their inbox. Um, so if you are sending emails through a platform that's not designed for cold emailing, like MailChimp, uh, MailJet, SendGrid, Guessware, Constant Contact, a lot of people are using these platforms that aren't designed for cold emailing for cold email. And that presents a number of problems um, outside of organization. But um, uh, these, these products that are built for cold emailing will do a lot of things for you. Uh, that the other platforms will not. So one of the things is sending through your Gmail or Microsoft account. Now, Gmail and Microsoft, they know uh, where the emails are coming from. If they're coming from Constant Contact or MailJet or MailChimp, they are part of a blast. Uh, they know that right away, and they'll give extra scrutiny to it towards that email. Uh, if they come from another Gmail account or Microsoft account, um, they believe at first that they are part of a personalized, uh, personal one-off send. So that'll help you get inbox. Now, uh, random delays between sending. So if you do use constant contact, yes, we're MailChimp, uh, they will get blasted out, maybe 20 at a time, maybe 50 at a time, but a lot. Um, this is not uh, to your best interest. Um, you want them to be delayed between sends. You want a, a sort of a random number delay in between sends and the cold email platforms will do this for you. Um, so it looks more personalized. It looks like you created an email and sent it, created an email and sent it. Um, now another thing that these cold email platforms do for you is match the default font of the email provider. So if you're sending into Gmail, Gmail has a default font. I forget what it is. I think it's maybe Arial size 12 black. I don't know, something like that. But um, these platforms will allow you to create and compose an email in that same font, which looks like it was created just as a one-off email. If you send a high-density HTML email, um, it's going to lower your chances of being inbox. So suggest plain text font. Um, the fourth thing that's not on here, i got to add it. Um, uh, sorry, I have a little brain fart here. But um, uh, what did I want to mention? I'll move on for a sec. I'm going to come back to that. But... Uh, finally, um, organizing and piping all, all of your stuff together. So, um, you know, when you have email campaigns um, that are in another platform, 
and now that you have chosen to use another platform, you want to make sure there everything is connected. So your CRM is connected to your cold email platform as well as your newsletter platform so that uh, as soon as they uh, get through a cold email sequence, if they have not opted out, you can decide, depending on the country you're targeting and compliance issues, if you would like to dump them into sort of a evergreen you know, newsletter drip, something like that. Um, you also want to man manage opt-out, manage a blacklist accordingly. So uh, make sure your CRM is connected to your cold email platform. Um, that way you are not sending emails by accident to uh, people that have unsubscribed in one platform and uh, may also be in the other for some reason. Um, so that's that. Uh, let me just think real quick if I can remember what I wanted to mention as far as getting into the inbox is concerned. Um, this isn't what I was thinking, but uh, I just thought of one more. It's making sure that you're um, sending below the threshold. So your inbox, now that you are connected and sending through Gmail or Microsoft, you'll have a limit specific to you, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 emails a month. Um, so I know if, if you're trying to scale this, um, you may think, oh, well, 1,500 emails a month, that's just not scalable. Well, you can send more by creating more email addresses um, inside your Google Apps account, for example. Um, so go ahead and run with that. Um, I'll link this uh, answer here in uh, the notes, and I'll put this up on Anchor so you can check it out, and I'll embed this into the answer so you can read it there. Thanks a lot.